everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Word of Life Church. It's a great day to be together in the house of God. Amen. Well, we are in the season of Eastertide. Still, Jesus is risen. We are not done celebrating just yet. Uh, and as we've been doing and will do through Eastertide, starting with the Easter greeting, the Paschal greeting, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, welcome everybody here in the room, everyone joining us online. So grateful to worship together today and have a wonderful service. We'll sing together. We'll pray. And I just encourage you, let's with joy, as we celebrate the resurrected Christ, can we join in together with joy this morning? Uh, we'll come to the table together at the high point of our service. So if you are joining us online, get your communion elements ready to go so you can participate. Uh, some of you are already doing it. Would you stand together with us as we pray this confession of worship? We have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to this moment to worship God. We have come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are not here to be entertained. We are here to encounter the sacred. We are not consumers, we are worshipers. We praise and adore the living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.
Bless my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears And they laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all
reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this to them, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were di disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and, on, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold in all his redeeming work, whose life, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold him
Good morning, church. It's Easter tide. Christ is risen. Do I gotta bring the kids from kids camp back in here? Because last week they were a lot louder than you adults. Let's try that again. Christ is risen. I believe in the resurrection. Because here's the deal. If Christ has not been risen up from the dead, then you're still in your sins. Your faith is futile. What are you even doing here on a Sunday morning if Christ didn't get up on that first Easter Sunday morning, busting out of that tomb with new life? But we believe that Jesus died for our sins, that he went down into death. And you know what happened there. He trampled over death by his death, triumphing over the grave, raised to new life. And now here we are on the Lord's day, celebrating the joy of the resurrection. And I'm so glad that you are here. We're gonna go ahead and dismiss our six, seven, eight students for their time of ministry. Everybody else here in the building, take just a moment, say hello to the people around you, and then you may be seated. feeling some Christmas or some Easter joy, rather. I believe there's joy in the house, and so I'm glad that you are here on this Sunday, both with us in person and online. Welcome uh, to all of our uh, members of our online congregation and those of you who've joined us online. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. We recognize that Word of Life Online um, has become a true lifeline, like tethering people to the Christian faith. And so if you're new to Word of Life Online, my name's Derek. I'm one of the pastors here. I spend a lot of time with our online congregation. And if you're new to Word of Life Online, we'd like to connect with you. And there is a form at wolc.com forward slash connect. And if you wouldn't mind filling that out, I'll reach out to you later this week. We'd love to connect with you, maybe tell you a little bit more about our online community. And if you are in the building and you are our guest, welcome. I'm still Derek. Uh, that doesn't change. And uh, I'm also spending a lot of time with you in-person folks. And, uh, but if you're visiting Word of Life and you're in the building, welcome. And if you wouldn't mind uh, filling out one of our Connect cards, it's in the pew back right in front of you. There's a card that says Connect. There's a pin there. If you wouldn't mind uh, filling that out and putting that Connect card in an offering bucket in just a moment, then I'll reach out to you uh, in-personers. Uh, but if you're our guest, welcome. We are glad to have you this morning. And church, let's prepare ourselves now to worship the Lord through giving. Uh, this is what we do together as a church family, both online and in person. And so here at Word of Life, we make it easy for you to give, whether you're in the building or you're online. Everybody can text to give. You can use the app. You can use the newly designed website uh, to give, or you can use envelopes if you are here in the room. And giving, for me, is a weekly reminder of what Jesus said, and that is that life is not a matter of accumulating more things. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Even though in the world you see that, right? In the world you see that, that success in life is defined by how much you can grab, how much you can grab onto, how much you can make and earn and possess. And, and it's always more and more and more. Uh, but this sacred act of giving you know, that we do as a part of worship uh, is a reminder not only of the words of Jesus, but also the words of the Rolling Stones. And that is, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. Yeah, yeah. So as we are faithful in giving, we recognize we can't get everything anyway. But if we're faithful in giving, trusting God with our financial life, we find out we get what we need because God is faithful. Amen? Let's pray over our offering this morning. I'll lead us in that prayer, and we'll also pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we do find that we get what we need. 
that, Lord, you are faithful to provide for us. Lord, we thank you that your faithfulness, indeed, it endures from generation to generation. And so, Lord, because we want to resist a culture of wanting more, we come into your house to give, to give into tithes and offerings, to give to you as an act of worship. And so, Lord, we give in faith today, and we give praying in Jesus' name. And now, church, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We'll go ahead and pass the offering buckets here in the building. And while buckets are being passed, a few reminders. Uh, gentlemen, next men's breakfast is coming up this Saturday, 9 a.m. So don't forget, John, don't forget. Talking, talk, yeah, don't forget. Let's see, last month you forgot. Put it in your calendar. 9 a.m. this Saturday, next men's breakfast. Do get signed up. We need a head count for the meal, so get signed up online or in the foyer. And our own Richard Stadelman is going to be uh, giving his testimony and sharing his story, a life that has been transformed by Jesus. And so, uh, gentlemen, you're going to enjoy that. We're also going to be talking a little bit about what we're going to do next as a, as, a, as a men's group. And so, looking forward to that. That's going to be this Saturday in the Life Center, 9 a.m get signed up. And then coming up in May, a couple things to mention in May. On Friday, May the 3rd, we are going to be hosting a worship night in the upper room. Uh, Cole and members of the worship team will be leading us in, in song. We'll be, we'll be singing our prayers together. Uh, so night of worship, that's coming up 7 p.m. Friday night, May 3rd. And then two things happening on the first Sunday in May. On May the 5th, we will have graduation recognition. And so if you are graduating from any level, like if you're graduating out of preschool into kindergarten, oh, that's not you, y'all aren't in here. But if you're graduating from high school, college, graduate school, any kind of technical program, if you're any kind of graduate, we want to recognize you both in person and online. And so if you would, if you are graduating or there's a graduate in your family that you want to sign up, get them signed up in the foyer or online for that. And then also that Sunday, May the 5th, will be our next new member lunch. And so if you have been hanging out with us all this time, well, you ought to just come into the family officially and become a member. And so our new member lunch is hosted by uh, myself and my wife, and it's right after church, Sunday, May 5th. This is how you become a member. Make this church family your official church family. Uh, so get signed up if you're coming to the lunch. And if you want to join Word of Life online, uh, you can do that. There isn't a lunch, but there is a link. Hey, how about that? Not a lunch, but a link. WOLC.com forward slash online members. And you can join Word of Life online. You're invited to do so. All right, that's all I have. I'm excited for the message today because it's coming from our own Pastor Jacob Taylor. Pastor Jacob, I hand it off to you. Thank you, Pastor Derek. And you mentioned the newly designed website, which is great, but it has caused some problems. For those of you who have wondered what happened to the Word of Life Church podcast on Apple Podcast, onlineers, we know, we know. And we're working on it. Be gracious to us. Uh, Christ is risen, but the podcast is currently dead. Um, we believe it will be raised to life. We are working actively on that. So just be patient and know that we believe it will be raised to life again and be working soon. So anyway, uh, if you're a guest here at Order Life, welcome. My name is Jacob, and I'm excited to be here with you this morning. And um, it is the third Sunday of the Easter season. Did you know there are seven Sundays in Easter tide? This is beautiful because there are six Sundays in Lent. And it just it's just a little a little something that those who put together the church calendar put in there and they're like, "Oh yeah, because life is greater than death and redemption is greater than suffering." So there's seven Sundays in Easter, six Sundays in Lent. So this is the third Sunday 
of Easter, and uh, we're going to talk about ghosts, death, and fear. Happy Easter, everyone. (laughs) Sounds more like a Halloween message than an Easter message, but uh, stick with me. I believe if you do, you'll you'll be encouraged this morning. Uh, Before we continue, would you join me in prayer one more time? Lord Jesus, we come before you, and as we gather in your name this morning, we recognize your presence here. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. May your kingdom come here on the earth in this place at this time as it is in heaven. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Okay, ghosts, death, and fear. First, let's start with ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts? I don't know. In Atchison, Kansas, just down the road, anyone from Atchison? Yes, my friends. Perfect. Porter and Callie, Joel from Atchison, a couple other people from Atchison. Apparently, there's a bunch of haunted houses in Atchison. If that's your thing, it's just right down the road. Uh, But I'm not going to get into the woods this morning about what Christians should think and believe about ghosts. I'm just going to tell you that our gospel reading this morning is a bit of a ghost story. And I'd like to, uh, we heard it during worship, but I'd like to revisit the first half of our gospel reading from Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 36 and going through 43. Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. Can we just pause there and receive that this morning? We gathered in Jesus' name and therefore he is here with us and I believe he is speaking to us in a war-torn world, peace be with you. I pray that we could receive that. I pray that our world could receive that this morning. So Jesus stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. See, I told you, ghost stories, it's right there, all right? My grandmother was not happy with my choice of topics this morning, but it's the Bible. So uh, if she's listening, Granny, I know, it's here though, and we got to discuss it. So they were seeing a ghost, they thought, when they saw Jesus, but Jesus said to them, why are you frightened? That's our sermon title this morning, why are you frightened? Jesus asks the disciples this question, and I believe that he's asking us this question this morning as well. For some of us, Jesus is asking, why are you frightened? Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus is doing a little ghostology here, teaching us about what ghosts have and what they don't have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. I'd like to say to you this morning, Jesus is not a ghost. The resurrection was the real deal. Jesus, who in bodily form was crucified on Good Friday, that same body was taken down from the cross and laid in the tomb and was dead on Holy Saturday, And that body now glorified was raised on Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. You guys are catching on. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good news this morning. It was not Easter Sunday. It was not Jesus going into death and then returning as a disembodied spirit to comfort his friends and family. Now, he did come and comfort his friends and family, but he came in bodily form. And yet, isn't it interesting that Jesus standing and talking in the presence of the disciples to them still did not convince them? If you struggle with doubts, you're in good company. Think about that. Jesus is standing in their midst, talking to them in bodily form. And they are not convinced, they are filled with skepticism. It must be a ghost. He says to them, well, here, look at these scars in my hands. Look at this scar in my side. This is the body that you saw crucified just 
this last Friday. You saw the crucifixion. Here are the scars. Look and see. They're still not convinced. He says, Put, here, feel them. Touch me. Touch and see. It's me. I wonder how many of us have seen Jesus, heard Jesus, experienced Jesus, felt Jesus in our life, and yet we still, at this place in our journey, go, ah, I'm just not sure. I just want to say, keep hanging out. Just stay with us. Just be a part. That's the disciples. They don't run away. It's a ghost. No, they just they stay put. And Jesus continues to reveal himself. Next, he says, do you have anything to eat? Do you have anything to eat? Each Sunday, we come to this table, and Jesus prepares a meal. He sits and eats with us. It's an echo of that road to Emmaus story that we heard. Just earlier in this chapter of Luke, the two disciples were on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes as a stranger to them. They don't recognize him. But as they talk and converse, their hearts are burning within them. They, they in retrospect, realize. But it's when they sit and eat and Jesus breaks bread, that their eyes are opened and they see Jesus is with us. My prayer is that as we come to this table each and every Sunday, that we would experience the reality that Jesus is with us. Amen? Amen. I want to back up for a moment. It's interesting most of the time, doubt in our life arises from, like, normally bad circumstances, right? Terrible things happen to us, and this can cause us to doubt the goodness of God. One theologian said, it's not just the existence of God that's the greatest question in faith, but it's the goodness of God. Is God really good? In this situation, it's interesting, isn't it, that it says, while in their joy, they were disbelieving, and still wondering. It's as if it was too good to be true. Have you ever experienced such faithfulness from God that you could hardly believe it in the moment? That's what the disciples are experiencing here. For some of us, we go through life and we have been so disappointed so often, so deeply hurt that we live life guarded all of the time, keeping everyone at a distance as an act of self-preservation, just to survive, that we, we wouldn't be disappointed again. We keep everyone at arm's length, including God. And Jesus comes to bring us new life, and while in our joy we're still disbelieving, no, it can't be. It can't be this good. Well, let me tell you, the good news of the risen Christ is that good. I just invite you to let your guard down this morning. Just let those walls be broken down, and let Jesus come to you this morning, reveal himself to you, and bring you peace. It's good news this morning. Jesus is risen. Amen. So Jesus sits and shares this meal with them. I just want to say that as he does, he is the resurrected Jesus, which is a little strange when you think about all of the stories. We have the Emmaus Road story where Jesus is unrecognizable, but then he breaks the bread and now they recognize him and then it says, then he disappeared from them. We have the story of the disciples gathered together and Jesus just walks through a locked door and appears to them. We have the story of the gardener that is in the tomb and they, they think that he's the gardener and then they see that it's Jesus when he calls out Mary's name. All of this leaves us maybe like the disciples filled with disbelief and wonder, what is it about the resurrected Jesus? And I just want to say, just to reiterate, whatever the resurrected Jesus is, whatever that glorified body is, it is not a ghost. Can we establish that this morning? Jesus is not a ghost. And so now that we know that Jesus is not a ghost, why am I harping on that? Why is it important? Because I'd like to take us to our next topic, and that is death. We covered ghost, now let's talk about death. If Jesus is not a ghost, that means that Jesus really overcame death. That death has been defeated, not figuratively, not allegorically, not rhetorically, but unequivocally and quite literally, Jesus raised from the dead and death has been defeated. Can I get an amen this morning? Oh, that's good news. One of the church fathers, Cyril of Alexandria, said this in the fifth century. When Jesus shed his blood for us, Jesus Christ destroyed death and corruptibility. Can I just say that again? Jesus Christ destroyed death and corruptibility. 
For if he had not died for us, we should not have been saved. And if he had not gone down among the dead, death's cruel empire would not have been shattered. Death's cruel empire has been shattered. This is how the apostle writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And death's cruel empire has been shattered. He goes on to write, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You guys thought that was a gladiator quote, didn't you? (laughs) No. (laughs) Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's the apostle quoting some prophets and Ecclesiastes. It's basically saying if the dead are not raised, if resurrection is not the real deal, this is his whole point of writing the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Let me just say this. I, I invite you today on the third Sunday of Easter to find some time just to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and read. There's about 50 verses. Pastor Derek was actually quoting from it this morning in our segue when he was encouraging us. Paul is giving his best argument for belief in the resurrection of Christ. There was a whole faction in his day that did not believe that resurrection was real. They thought it was just a figure of speech. And he's saying, if the dead are not raised, then nothing matters. Let's eat and drink because tomorrow we die. In fact, he goes on to say, as Christians, those who believe in the resurrection, we are to be pitied above all other men because we've just wasted our whole life believing in a Christ that could not conquer death. If death has not been defeated and resurrection is not real, then none of this matters. But the good news is, it all matters because death has been defeated. The cruel empire has been shattered. I'm just gonna keep saying it this morning because sometimes you just have to remind yourself of what you believe. Man, death has been defeated and that is good news this morning. Which takes me to our next point, and that is fear. If death has been defeated, then what do we have to be afraid of? Have you ever felt really scared? I I grew up hanging out in the woods, which I think is really good for kids, by the way. If I could be the grumpy old man now, I got like a white beard coming in. My daughter hates it. She's, Dad, shave that off. I said, no way, man. This is like my, this is my permission right now to go, kids ought to get outside more. Get out from behind the TV, playing video games, go outside and play. Can I get a name? Y'all are more excited about kids going outside than the resurrected Christ. I, I believe it though. I spent my childhood, we were, I would like ride on my bicycle with my tackle box in one hand holding this handlebar, my fishing pole in the other, anyone else. And I'd, I'd, all summer, every day, go to the lake down the road from my house. We grew up in the woods. I had, uh, you know, we rode bikes and I had go-karts and we built some go-kart tracks through the woods. And one day my friends and I were working on some go-kart ramps. It wasn't just enough adrenaline to race go-karts through the woods, but we wanted to jump the go-kart. So I had my dad's shovel. My dad would let me borrow his tools, but the rule was that if you borrowed something that you return it. And so one night I realized at the dinner table that I had left dad's shovel in the woods. And so after dinner, the sun had set. I thought I got to go get the shovel. So I go out in the middle of the woods. I didn't have a flashlight. I was just like, I don't know, nine years old. And I go to find dad's shovel. And let me tell you, if you've never been scared, go out into the woods at night by yourself. You think, I'm going to go camping by myself, hang out with Jesus, and you spend all night like completely like aware and hyper-focused on all the sounds around you. The boogeyman becomes real, at, you know, like your worst fears come to life. The woods are terrifying. It's interesting that for some of us, we go looking for the thrill of being scared. Do I have any like adrenaline junkies that love being frightened? You go to horror houses and stuff. Some people do that. I think maybe we do that because we long for the sacred in a secular world. Pastor Brian wrote a blog like in 2013 and he said, uh, to be scared is the poor man's substitute for the sacred. Whew, that's, that's good. For some of us, we like a good scare, probably, I don't know, because we're longing for something more, the sacred. Have you ever had a friendly scare when when a friend jumps out from behind a door when you walk in a room and they say, boo, and you you jump, oh, God. 
Some of you swing. Your first reaction is to swing. Uh, but then you turn around and what you thought you were afraid of was just a loved one, someone who loves and cares about you. Can I, can I ask you to hold on to that picture uh, for later in our sermon? Just think about that. Someone jumps out to scare you as a, as a friendly just for fun. And your first reaction is fright. Oh, God, something's going to get me. And you turn and you realize it's just, oh, it's just someone I love. And then joy comes. Fear is gone. Just hold on to that for later on. So we've got these, this, kind of, this kind of lighthearted fear. But then there are real fears, right? And I think that at some level, most of us have a real fear of death, a fear of the unknown. We're afraid of what may harm us or harm our loved ones. We're afraid of loss, afraid to be alone, afraid to be powerless, afraid to be unknown, the fear of getting hurt, the fear of being uncomfortable. These are all legitimate human fears. I just want to say that if you struggle with these fears, I don't take it lightly this morning. But I'll say that to fear these things in one way is to experience being human. But being human doesn't have to be defined by the fears that we share. Jesus invites us into a new way of being human. A way where perfect love comes among us. God comes, Emmanuel, God with us. And in Christ experiences every human fear with us. He faces the greatest fear of all, the greatest enemy of all, death. And he goes down right into death and he comes on the other side of death on the third day in resurrection life with the keys of death and hell in his hands, victorious. The fears have been conquered. That's why 1 John says perfect love casts out all fear. And perfect love came among us and joined us as a human that he might cast out the fears that have been shackled to us, keeping us in bondage. Some of us live enslaved to fear. Jesus wants to come among us this morning and speak a word that would set you free and bring you peace. Amen? In fact, Jesus says in John chapter 14, My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy what my grandmother told me growing up often. She would say, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I just have this little thought experiment. This, I've been thinking about this. It's not in my notes, but fear. Think about this. Fear drives us to our instinct to survive. Fear was given to us as like a, an animalistic survival instinct. You're afraid, so you go into flight or fight mode so that you can survive. So fear drives us to our instinct to survive. Okay, but our instincts are more animalistic. That's where we share with the mammals, right? But God has breathed his life into us. And what is God? God is love. First John, you can read in chapter four, God is love. And where perfect love is, fear cannot be because perfect love casts out fear. So as we are being transformed more into the image of Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit, we are becoming more and more beings of love rather than fear. And what does love do? Love does this. On the cross is the perfect picture of love, which is not Jesus surviving, but Jesus laying down his life for the world. Isn't that interesting? So that for a parent, a parent might be in survival instinct because of fear, but as soon as it comes to their children, they're willing to lay down their own life because they love their child. May we be a people of love, that don't just go through life gripped by fear in survival mode, but may we transcend fear, be filled with the Spirit of God, and become beacons of love in the world where we willingly lay down our life for the sake of another. Amen? Amen. 
If we believe the good news that Jesus rose from the grave in resurrection, then we can come to the conclusion that Jesus is not a ghost. Okay? If Jesus is not a ghost and he really did raise from the grave, then we can be assured that death has been defeated and we have the promise that we too will be with Christ in resurrection. If Jesus is not a ghost and death has been defeated, then we need not fear. As the church has proclaimed since the resurrection, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Almost like laughing in the face of death. Ghosts, death, and fear. We've covered all three. I've kind of taken you through my logic reasoning on why we should not be afraid. But I'd like to close with a story about how the Lord was able to deliver me from one of my fears. Can I do that? It's kind of a crazy story. It's a little wild. Uh, In college, I was on a missions trip to Russia. I went to Vladivostok, Russia for a month, and we were serving homeless kids. We were working with a great organization there to run like soup, street soup kitchens, and then we took them all to a summer camp outside the city. Uh, But it was a very heavy, hard month. Um, And on our flight home, we had a layover in Seoul, Korea, South Korea, on the night that South Korea played the World Cup, man, the city was electric. It was awesome. Like, just the grace of God. God's like, oh, you all were suffering on the missions field here. I'm just going to grant you a party for one night, you know, uh, like a healing bomb. So we went out and had kimchi and watched the World Cup with the rest of South Korea. And uh, my co-leader and I, we had about 10 other people on our, our missions team, but we were the leaders for the team. And we were kind of debriefing our month that we had just been through. And then we were realizing that we were now going home to face some realities. And for her, she was in a very serious relationship she felt like had come to a head where she needed to decide whether this relationship would continue and probably marry this guy or whether she was going to walk away from the relationship. And it was very, like, it caused her a lot of anxiety and she was very troubled over this. It felt like a big decision. She shared with me some details and things, and then uh, we, we all went to bed, woke up the next morning, got on a Korean air flight, 10-hour flight back to LAX. And my co-leader and I get our seats. There's three seats in our section. She sits by the window. I sit in the middle, and then we had the, the infamous mystery seat. Do you know about this, those that travel on airplanes? The mystery seat is the seat that's empty next to you when you sit down, and you wonder. The thing that fills your mind while you sit there is who is going to sit next to me? Are they going to smell weird? Are they going to do weird stuff? Are they going to be friendly? Are they going to talk too much? Are they going to do just enough talking that you feel like, oh, this was lovely? Or will I strike the jackpot and no one at all will come to sit next to me and I can stretch out on this 10-hour international flight? Time goes on. Last call for boarding happens. Nobody's come yet, I think. Glory to God in the highest. This is amazing. Right before they shut the door, on walks six foot three army soldier, golden glove boxer who is large, loud, and very drunk. Okay? There's there's an army base in Seoul, so he was on a flight home. He comes walking down the aisle, stumbling down the aisle. And let me just tell you, Korean culture is not large, loud, and obnoxious, okay? Korean culture is very respectful, rather quiet. And so this guy comes on this flight, and everyone is watching, and he stumbles until he gets to Aro, and he stops. And the mystery is solved. (laughs) And he sits down next to us, and now everyone thinks we're a group, The Americans, they're all loud, large, and obnoxious. And man, this guy, I won't tell you all the details. If we go to lunch sometime, I can really like tell you it was a wild ride. But come to find out, he was on a flight home because his mother had passed away uh, suddenly in St. Louis, and he was in grief. Uh, Therefore, the excessive drinking and coping with that loss He was very lost. He was lost in his grief, but he was also lost because he had grown up a pastor's kid. 
and had walked away from his faith. He was running from God and he began to ask us questions. So where are you guys from? And we told him, what are you doing here? We were in Russia on a missions trip. And he goes, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I was just in a bar and now I'm sitting next to Christians. He goes, you're not those tongue talking Christians, are you? Well, we're from ORU, Oral Roberts University. Hallelujah. Shandai. <laughs> oh, Lord. And he's talking that loud on, a, on an airplane with a bunch of quiet, respectful Koreans. And he goes, the Lord, and we begin to talk and he tells us his story and we thought that our ministry time was over, but it, the grand finale was happening on this 10 hour flight. We, I ended up like praying with this guy. He's weeping. There's Ray Bolts involved, headphones with Ray Bolts, and he's singing at the top of his lungs, Thank you for giving to, you know. I mean, it's a circus, guys. And then he passes out on the tray table in front of him, like just asleep. Thank God. Okay. Now we can get some rest. A couple hours go by, and he wakes up. And do you guys know the story of Balaam's donkey? King James Version. I always say if God can speak through Balaam's ass, he can speak through anyone. Okay? That's King James translation. Um, and so God goes on to do that. This young man wakes up, and he looks at my co-leader, and he says, hey, the Lord wants you to know that as you go home, you have nothing to worry about. And he begins to tell her specific things that we had just talked about the night before. I'm not making this up. This is like, I, this was the Lord speaking through this man. Our mystery seat rider, our loud, obnoxious, drunk, golden glove boxer who was running from God, far from home. And the Lord shows up and speaks through him to her. And then he looks at me. I remember just how he did it. He kind of, he's still drunk. He's like, and you. <laughs> and he looks at me. And he goes, you, you got something to say. I was like, I don't have anything to say. He's like, no, you have something to say. I'm like, I'm not trying to fight anybody. He goes, no, you got something to say, but you're afraid to say it. And I knew exactly what he meant. Since I was a young man, I felt like God had called me to do things like preach and pastor and I was on the fence in college about whether I was going to lean into that calling because I had grown up also with a crippling insecurity and fear of what people thought of me. My whole life I felt like was kind of built around being insecure and trying to please people. And so the thought of getting up and preaching terrified me. He said, you got something to say, but you're afraid to say it. And I said, okay, you're right. And he says, the Lord wants you to know you're not going to be afraid anymore. I said, well, amen. Hallelujah. He goes, oh, no, I want you to say it. Say, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. Everyone is sleeping around us. I said, the lights are out. The hum of the engines. I said, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. He said, no, you say it like you mean it. I said, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. He goes, and he grabs me. He physically starts to assault me, all right? I want you to say it like you mean it. And I'm like, everyone is waking up around us. I said, I got to get this over with. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. Okay, you happy? He's like, yes. And he passes out for the rest of the flight. <laughs> Completely knocked out till we arrive at LAX. We all get off the plane. I've never talked to the guy, seen the guy since. I don't know, maybe, who knows. Fast forward to the next year. I went to a Christian university where we had chapel and... We had a, a chapel service every year devoted to outreach ministries. And they had asked me, I was a senior at the time, to speak because I was on staff with our outreach department. We would work with the under-resourced in our community and other organizations with students and volunteers and things. And so I said yes, that I would preach this chapel in front of the whole student body. And I remember I was standing on the side of the platform with my notes that I had prepared and I was like terrified. I was like gripped with such fear that I, I felt like I was going to pass out. And in that moment, this voice of this loud, large, obnoxious, drunk, golden glove boxer comes to me. I hadn't thought about, I mean, just in that moment said, you're not going to be afraid anymore. And the nerves left and I went out, I preached a sermon 
and felt completely at home and at peace in the presence of Jesus. Yeah, amen. I mean, I'm not here to applaud like, oh, look, I can preach. But I'm applauding the work of Jesus to cast out fear. The work of Jesus through the most random ways. The Lord will work in the craziest of ways just to love us just to cast out fear, just to shatter the cruel empire of death that has kept us shackled with fear for far too long. Remember that example that I talked about when a loved one jumps out and scares you? This morning, I pray that that would be true for us with our fear. Say that we have the fear of death or the death of a loved one has left us shaken and frightened. My prayer is that in that moment, in our fear of death, we would turn around and find that it is true. The one who ascended is also the one who descended, Jesus Christ, who has filled all things with himself. Even death is filled with the presence of Jesus. So now when we, in our fear of death, turn to look at death, you know who we find there? Not what we are fearful of, but rather Christ himself, the one who loves and cares for us. So it is true for all of our fears. May you, when you are frightened by the bill that comes in that you can't pay, the diagnosis that leaves you with no hope, may in that place you find, instead of the thing you fear most, the very presence and peace of Christ, the one who loves and cares for you. May he grant you your peace. and May you hear him ask you this morning, why are you frightened? And why are you troubled? My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Amen. Would you stand on your feet? We have the opportunity now to come and experience the very presence of Jesus this morning at this table. In just a moment, the ushers are going to release you row by row, and as they do, you'll come down front and someone will have a basket of bread and they will say to you, the body of Christ broken for you, take a piece of the bread. And then the next person will have a cup of juice and they will say, the blood of Christ shed for you, take the bread, dip it in the cup and receive into your life perfect love in the presence of Christ found at this table And may all fear be removed, dispelled, and shattered in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us now confess our faith together, and then we will pray a prayer of confession of sin, receive forgiveness and absolution, and then we will come to the table together. Would you confess our faith with me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sin and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say to you, your sins are forgiven. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, 
You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. For it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.
rejoice just a little bit more this morning in the victory of Christ. Man, we get to go into our week knowing that because of Christ, we are more than conquerors, that we can walk with confidence, no longer shackled by fear, but walking in faith, believing that perfect love has come. Amen? Amen. If you're a guest with us, if this was your first time with us this morning, we're really glad that you've joined us for church. And we have a gift that we would love to give you. As you exit today, you can stop by the welcome kiosk in the foyer and say hello. Let them know that you're new here and uh, they'll give you a great gift I think you'll enjoy. And as you go into the rest of your week, let me speak this blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God bless you. Go in peace.